now. Up real quick. I'm, I'm seeing you two, you two fellas, but I, I don't know if you can see me. Um, I, I just want to say um, I'm, I'm Bob Orris, and then uh, I, you've been talking with uh, Andre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can. I can see you. Okay, great, great, thanks. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so let's go ahead. Um, I just want to start off the question: uh, How did, um, how did the idea of the Spark come about? Um, I know that um, previously you were with, um, you had created Dangerous Things um, mm -hmm. through the crowdfunding campaign, and just give a description of how exactly it came about. Sure. Yeah. So just kind of a, a breakdown of the timeline. So. Uh, 2005, I got my first transponder implanted in my left hand, it's still there. Um, 2007, uh, Wiley Publishing uh, asked me to write a book, RFID Toys, which I did. It had one page about implants, uh, but the rest was just about RFID and, and hobbyist electronics, uh, which was coming of age, right? It, 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 there were components that were becoming available for uh, hobbyists to use that were cheap and easy to use and integrate. So. Um, by 2013, there was enough interest that people wanted to do, you know, what I had done and implant a, a, a microchip, but they were sourcing it very badly, and just, it was it was pretty terrible. So the two main things that I wanted to accomplish with Dangerous Things was uh, to be able to make sure the things that we sold were safe, tested safe, and for the uh, procedure to be done safely. Uh, so helping people get it done safely, and, and however that happened to manifest was. Uh, we got professional body piercers and doctors on board as partners, and then we refer people to them and yeah, help people through. Some people still do do it themselves, uh, which we do not advise, uh, but um, but they do. And um, anytime there's been an issue with infection or or improper placement, it's been a self-install. So um, again, we're pushing people toward those professional partners. Um, about 2015 or so. Uh, well, well. To be clear, Dangerous Things was started first as uh, um, um, selling uh, um, sourced low-frequency chips, and so these were 125 kilohertz chips, EM 4102s, and then T5577s. And then we did crowdfund very quickly um, the XNT, which is the world's first implantable NFC transponder. And now you can see there's like stuff you can buy off Alibaba that's questionable and whatever. But at the time it was, it was, it didn't exist. So we, we did that uh, through crowdfunding and it, it raised almost four times the goal, which, you know, kind of showed me this is, this is the time to really, I mean, we'd already started, you know, the business model around this just so that I wouldn't keep wasting my time answering emails about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it was like proof that this is where we're going. So let's, let's, let's do this thing. But about 2015, 2016, people started to ask different questions. So the customers were asking, initial customers were very technically oriented. They were asking questions like, um, where's the data sheet? Do you have any code samples? How do I wire this up? And then people started asking questions like, this is cool. What else can I do with it? What what can I, what, what will this enable me to do? So the, the type of uh, customer was changing. And I asked myself uh, a critical question. I was actually uh, wondering around uh, in between meetings, and I was just like, what problem are we solving here? What is the problem that we're attacking? Is it just a convenience issue and we want to get rid of our keys and all that? Um, and, I, and I realized, no, like a problem that we could solve, that we're not currently solving, is digital identity. And the idea of, um, you know, introducing a, a, an ironclad, rock-solid digital identity that's as easy and convenient to use as biometrics. And the problem that you usually run into with with um, security versus convenience is that they're inverse, right? You have something that's very convenient, it's not secure. You have something that's very secure, but it's not convenient. And biometrics at, on the surface, fingerprints, iris scan, they seem to solve that problem, but in reality, it is not secure. Uh, biometric identification is great at identifying, it is terrible at authenticating. And the reason is that you can passively, through face recognition, cameras, through fingerprint sensors, you touch passively as you're turning your phone on, through all other kind of means, you can passively and without the person's consent usually, uh, identify them. And this comes in a, you know, in the form of uh, public uh, face recognition, CCTVs, you know, cities like, uh, com whole companies like City Watcher feed in all the uh, CCTV footage from security cameras around entire um, cities, towns, and countries, really, and 
do face processing. And so there's all these problems with biometrics, even on phones. You don't really know where your enrolled data is going, how long it's retained. Is it is it being sent off to third parties? You have no control over that. And the other issue is that um, it doesn't do a good job of securing your data. Um, you can see tons and tons and tons of, in, of, of examples of biometrics constantly being fooled, um, phones being opened, you know, things like that. So great at identifying, terrible authenticating. And so, you know, the idea with VivoKey was that we could introduce a cryptographic proof in an implant that would be readable by NFC trans, uh, readers that are inside of smartphones um, or other, you know, you know, desktop readers or whatever. But the point is that you have a cryptographic proof, which is utilizing strong cryptography, which is very secure, but because it's an implant, you break that inverse relationship between security and convenience, and you allow things to be as convenient as biometrics, but also very secure, uh, with the device itself being totally under your control. If you want to change your cryptographic token, you can do that. If you want to change, you know, associated or disassociated with services, you can do that. So, um, Really, that was the impetus behind VivoKey is like, we need to solve a real problem and we need to do it in a way that uh, that we believe in. And we believe in the power of implants. I mean, I can speak to a few cases where security uh, becomes possible or, or even enhanced because of the convenience that an implant provides. And there's, there's a practical one, which is uh, going in and out of a door. I go in and out of a, uh, my office door here. I'm, my lab's in the garage. Um, but the door to this garage has an RFID reader door latch, right? I have to present my implant to it and the re and, and it closes and it's locked. And the reason we had to do that is because my kids were getting into, you know, the chemicals and the scalpels. And so, you know, we had to like secure <laughs> yeah. that. So if this door had, if this door required a key, right, it wouldn't work. I go in and out of that door a hundred times a day. It just does not, it would not work. And, and and so you would end up be leaving it unlocked when you're in here or, you know, you you pop out for a bit just because oh, I'm gone for 30 seconds, you know, leave the door unlocked. And in that 30 seconds, anybody the kids knows, in that 30 seconds, they'll get in and they'll, you know, hurt themselves. So, so because of the convenience factor of an implant, it's always there. It's frictionless. I don't think about it. I don't manage it. It's just part of my new capabilities as a human being. And I have that expectation. I can leave the door functional in the way that it is, which is it's locked all the time. I have to present to unlock it. I open the door. As soon as it closes, it's locked again. And this is enhanced security because of the convenience that an implant brings. The other factor is uh, my smart gun pro project. So I have a, a FNP90 smart rifle bullpup design that will unlock the trigger when I present, when I grip it, right? So it reads the implant yeah. when I grip it. In the realm of smart guns, it's really the only practical solution. An yeah. implant is the only practical solution to a smart gun. You can have a fingerprint reader, which has its failings, uh, doesn't work with gloves, doesn't work with water, doesn't work with dirt, doesn't, <laughs> you know, or you have to basically tone down the security so far that if you presented a potato to it, it would unlock the trigger, right? Um, so it's not, again, not secure. The, the other, um, you know, options are, uh, a special ring or a wearable that you wear and have to manage and charge and do all this stuff. And the the reality is that um, now you're, uh, now there's a few problems. One, not a lot of people like to wear a, what would be typically unfashionable device from a gun manufacturer, declaring you own a gun, declaring that, you know, uh, that, that you're willing to take on the fashion sense of a gun manufacturer. Um, you know, all these problems. So the, so these devices, these wearables tend to end up sitting right next to the gun uh, in the drawer, in the safe or wherever. So they become moot. And so in, these, in this scenario, again, the only advantage is, uh, the, the only practical solution is an implant. Um, that it's again, managementless, frictionless. It's just there, it does its job. Uh, I like to say it's, it's like your kidneys. They're in there working hard for you, but you don't give them a second thought because they're just part of who you are. And this is what a well-designed chip implant device will do. It just becomes part of your capabilities as a human being. And with VivoKey, considering that those chip implants can perform uh, cryptography, considering that the Apex um, product, which is coming out here pretty soon, will be able to arbitrary, run arbitrary code. You can write your own <laughs> Java card applications and deploy it to it. It is a Turing complete, small micro security oriented computer. Um, 
there's a lot that you can do with that, right? Um, but even just regressing to the spark, the spark was an answer to uh, the difficulty that the Apex product proved to be. And you know, when we first envisioned the VivoKey company and product, it started out as a as a, a product for dangerous things. It started out as the Yuki. Um, and very quickly I realized this needs to be a whole separate company and that company might have other products. And so the the difficulty in bringing this device, the Yuki that then turned into the Flex One that then turned now into the Apex, it's been four plus years um, of trying to get this particular product out. I mean, I had a prototype that I made that was um, you know, meant to be in for 30 days and it was here in my arm and that ended up being there for four years, just recently had it removed. You can see the big scar there. So that was a 35 millimeter diameter disc that has been now reduced to, um, you know, this flex device. Wow. So, um, but this is the prototype of the device, the apex that's coming out probably hopefully in a month. Um, and that is a device, but in the meantime, right, I had, been accelerated, uh, accepted by an accelerator program from SOSB called Rebel Bio. Uh, flew the whole family to London in 2018. Uh, we stayed there and for three, three and a half, four months, worked on the company, decided we need to get a product together. If we can't get this thing, we need something. So that's when the concept of the entire identity platform came around, the Spark being a cryptographic token for that platform, uh, open APIs for the platform to be integrated into other products and services um and and so on so that's where we're you know we've gone through several co-founders and um a bunch of turmoil getting the apex and things but that's essentially where we're at now and and um the spark 2 the, being the second release of the spark uh, the first one was based on an iso 15693 rf protocol device which is uh, nfc type 5 and it was working great and the great thing about iso 15693 is it's less energy intensive than uh, the more common ISO 1443A, meaning you get slightly better performance out of a very small injectable. However, Google introduced some change in Android 8 um, that totally wrecked reading ISO 15693 chips. Mm -hmm. um, we had we had sparks in the field. I had a, I have a spark in, in my left hand. And all of a sudden, you would get a, hey, upgrade your phone. You do it, and then you can't scan. It just errors, error, error, error. Every time you try to scan, very, very irritating. Worked with Google on it. They kind of threw their hands in the air and now it kind of sort of works. Um, so Spark 2 is based on an ISO 1443A protocol chip. Uh, it works slightly differently, but uh, but essentially the concept is the same. So we just released it as version two of the Spark. Um, the Spark 2 is now going through MRI testing for FDA labeling and approval. Um, where we're talking to some partner companies about potentially using it as a patient identity um, application. So they would integrate with our APIs and that would integrate with check-in processes and um, you know telemedicine, that kind of thing. Um, but all that needs approval first, of course. So that's what we're going through now. Wow. I know that was very long-winded, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean no, no. Speed, yeah. that, was, uh, that was excellent. That was... Um a lot of the questions I had you answered um, do you mind okay. if I uh, ask some follow-ups and some yeah. things that I, I uh, missed um, you you wrote a book they asked you to write a book but I missed the date when did that I I, I heard oh, the was... title was RFID toys right yeah RFID toys and that's uh, that was in 2007 okay great um, and then I wanted to ask when you started talking about the the uh, the gun security you really really piqued my interest i i'm uh, uh I, i'm former military retired military so i you know familiar with weapons but the 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 idea of you know having something keyed to a person um i think would be it would be amazing are any gun manufacturers so so if you had a weapon then would would you get something that you would uh, you know attach to the weapon that would uh, um, something not necessarily that? yeah so it, really what you need is a weapon designed with this around it um, for for it to be effective I think and in terms of military police that kind of thing uh, we've explored these ideas and actually rather than keying it to a person the concept that we had was that you would key it to a certification. So uh -huh. if you're certified on a weapon system, any member of the unit or military or whatever that is certified on that weapon can handle it. Therefore you can 
borrow weapons, you can you know, do what you need to do. Um, in terms of home defense, that probably would not be the case. Home defense sure. would be who are the authorized users, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, this is this is all. We we don't want to be gun manufacturers, right? So right. <laughs> so we have talked to certain manufacturers, including Mossberg shotguns, and um, they you know Jonathan, I think his name is Jonathan Mossberg. He uh, he actually has a patent on a magnetic um, system for activating a, a weapon like that. But you know we had some a couple conversations and he just wasn't into it um in particular i mean the home weapons market in the u.s there's been a lot of stigma around the idea of smart weapons in in general um there's a lot of resistance to it i mean i've gotten death threats since 2005 but there was a whole new spate of death, death threats from a whole new section of people when the smart gun project came out um you know it's just um, it's not a it's not a nice business <laughs> uh, be, being involved in this. So really, I mean, what I think it would be interesting, to be honest, is not focusing so much on small arms, but for focusing on larger systems. Yeah. You know, ensuring that like the person who's trained to operate the javelin missile is doing it right. Um, the person who is authorized to drive the M1 tank is doing it right. That kind of thing, um, or at least someone in the unit is 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 at the helm. So. Um, these kind of ideas are all possible, of course. It's just the, the problem for us, for Vivuki in general, is that human identity and secure human identity touches everything we do. And the number of vertical markets is infinite. And so how do, what do we focus on, right? So yeah. our, our philosophy at this point is to focus on being the bedrock upon which partner companies build these applications. So we don't, we're not building a patient identity application. We are enabling our partners to build those applications, for example. Um, we're working with a payment um, services company to enable uh, contactless payments with our devices, for example. So um, you know, each one of these markets requires a CEO with full focus on it to make it a reality. And we, we obviously recognize we can't do that. We, we focus on making the chip implant with the best features and the, the best security options, the best APIs, and the best safety, of course. So that's our role. I, uh, I, I like that because I, I understand what you're saying about the vertical markets. I mean, uh, when you were describing your office, of course, uh, going in in and out of, uh, you know, classified uh, storage areas and stuff, and I'm always, you know, swiping the card and putting in the yep. key. And, and and your example with that, if I could have just like touched it and that, with the implant and come in and out, uh, would have been remarkable. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I've seen cat cards too that are, that are left open um, in the open, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. they just lay lay, lay around. Uh, so you've got the issue of convenience factor of use. You've got the issue of securing that device. You've got the issue of loss. How much productivity is lost when you lose one of those devices need to be reissued one. Um, even if you just forget it, there's a day usually that goes, you know, you can't do anything. So um, in terms of enterprise or government or anything, you know, we are really hoping that we can, work from the ground up uh, through people, right? To bring this technology into those areas and then provide solutions that um, save money and time and productivity for uh, for enterprises that is, has a real impact. I mean, once you get to a certain size of company, you are paying a full-time employee just to manage security access, physical control access. So, you know, a lot of that is somebody didn't bring their card in today. They need a temporary or whatever it is, right? Yeah. So. Um, anyway, that's the idea. And in, in, in that scenario, it's important to point out that our philosophy there is that, uh, that the companies that are willing to incentivize uh, or purchase for the employee these chip implants is that it is a company uh, perk option. So it, it means that the employees, it, it, that chip implant is the employee's property, not the company's. Uh, the employee uh, has the device, the, the company may choose to enroll that device into their systems, and we will help them do that with the, with the software and such. But, but the important part is that it is in, in no way the company's property. And, and that is a very critical differentiation, I think, that people need to be need to understand in terms of, you know, if the company buys you a car, it's your car. If the company buys you a phone, it's your phone, right? If the company gets a chip implant for you, it's your chip implant. And how do you use that? How do you continue to maintain ownership over that? Um, th those are critical and important factors. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, law, particularly Eastern states, southern eastern states. There are now, I think, 12 states that have uh, RFID chip implant laws, which are all preliminary knee-jerk 
um, you know, <laughs> reactions to something that isn't a problem yet. But um, most of them have modeled this law after, I think, Georgia's law, which is um, in one part I agree, and the other part I think is asinine, uh, which is the part I agree with is that the mandate that you that a company or the government cannot require or mandate a chip implant for a job or for a position or whatever. Totally agree. I totally agree with that. However, they overstep the bounds, and then they also make it illegal for the company to incentivize in any way a chip implant. So, um, you know, removing uh, free market um, capitalism from the equation, uh, and obviously most of these uh, lawmakers are um, tend to be Republican and and on one hand speak you know about free market uh, you know policies, but then you know bash it on the other hand. So it, it's irritating, but. But so far, there hasn't been an outright ban. There, we we had a, a very close call in Nevada, actually. Nevada, actually, uh, Councilman Daly, which is, he's a Democrat, by the way, but he tried to, it was recorded in a session where he said, I basically don't want the, I want to outlaw these implants in Nevada. He, he, he actually said that. And um, so then the law that was written was basically you just couldn't get one <laughs> like it was going to find the hell out of anybody that would do it or implant it or and or, or promote it in any way um and it was written with some legalese to make it sound like it was on you doing you a favor but but really it was just a ban an outright ban and so we had people show up from the biohacking community um actually show up talk to council people about it say why it was wrong to remove choice um for somebody who wanted to do this um, and again, it got reduced to a mandate, right? You can't mandate it, which is fine. We totally agree with that. Um, but don't block people's choice to do it, right? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know where that leaves us. I kind of rambled on there. but <laughs> Well, I, actually, sir, um, one of my questions was, what legal challenges have you faced? So you, you just, again, uh, answered uh, one of those questions. Um, I can expand I, on the legal issue, too. Just okay. a little bit. Um, so other people ask about FDA approval, for example. Is an FDA approval required for these devices? And the answer is no. The FDA has three uh, primary tenets that if you tick any of those boxes, your device requires uh, FDA approval, basically. The big one is the first one, the diagnosis or treatment of disease. Um, we're not being used in that capacity in any sense of the word. Um, the other two are quite benign. There are, is your device listed in the USP Pharmacologica? or does it in, uh, interact with the body in terms of changing its structure or eluding drugs or anything like that, which obviously no. Now, the tricky part is because one of our partners is discussing patient identity applications, once you tie into the patient identity system or you're trying to bring up a medical record or anything like that, you are ticking that first box. Mm -hmm. You are participating in the diagnosis or treatment of disease in oh. some way. And so the reason that we didn't bother with FDA approval in the beginning which would have been a great marketing tool, right? Yes, our stuff's FDA approved. Uh, but the reason we did not do that is that um, because as soon as you do that, most of the body piercers that we partner with to do safe installations are then um, banned from dealing with that device because it is now a medical device and the state law says they cannot touch or deal with medical devices. So it was a very strategic decision not to get FDA approval for those devices. But now the Spark 2 in particular, um, you know, there is an application that requires it. So we're, we're going through that process. Just wanted to capture that because I think it's almost like uh, when you're talking about the convenience and the you know, security, you know, right? like so you get the FDA, which, hey, that sounds great, but then you lose half your or whatever percentage of your um, partners. Um, you mentioned you uh, with the Nevada thing that there was the um, uh, uh, forgive me, I, I forgot the word you said, but like biohackers or something like that. And how mm -hmm, big? Yeah. Can you estimate like how large of a community that is? Well, I, I mean, to be honest, it depends on what your definition is. So, um, okay. you know, bio biohacking, in my opinion, is kind of an umbrella term under which there are some silos. One is like, um, uh, well, I can actually send you a link if I can find it. I have a just a kind of a map of you know what is biohacking um, because I've you know in the back in the day I was doing talks every other week, so I have <laughs> yeah. a talk. Right. But, um, and but then we're a, asking... yeah, so I mean it was just top of the list. Like what is biohacking? Let me just see if I can find it real quick and dump it into the um the chat here. Mm -hmm.
we've taken so go. much of your time. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just looking right. at the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So this is the map. Great. Right. Okay. So um, you have some stuff, and if you if you're talking about like people that are putting chips in. Uh, that's probably about globally, I would say customers, you know, people that have done this, but might not categorize themselves as a biohacker. Um, that's probably close to about 100, maybe 200,000 at this point wow. people. Uh, but if you're talking about people that are kind of like very into the let's modify human <laughs> human body, let's let's get into this uh, hardcore uh, just in the augmentation side of that of that equation, that's not counting, you know, people dealing with DNA or uh, lifestyle hacking or any of that other stuff, um, I would probably estimate that to be closer to about 10 to 20,000 people who are pretty hardcore about it, have more than one chip implant, for example, um, kind of believe in the concept or, or back the concept of transhumanism, um, which is, you know, fundamentally changing the human condition, uh, presumably through technology. But um, yeah, so these are, I would say, probably pretty good es estimates. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and shut up because Andre has questions too. But uh, I, I was looking on uh, um, Google Play Store, saw saw your app. Um, so is app developing, is that something that, uh, like that uh, your company does or is that another thing where you have kind of the bedrock and then somebody uh, you know adds to that? Sure. So the VivoKey app itself is developed by us. Um, and if a if a partner needed app development, we would we would uh, consider taking that process on, depending on what the application was and what the arrangement was. Um, but yeah, I mean, we we don't provide. It's not what we provide application development services, but um, but we developed our own apps, yes, for the VivoKey uh, platform itself. And we also have a VivoKey authenticator, which is um, it's outside of the VivoKey app. It's it's works with our um, it's going to work with the Apex. It worked with the prototypes that we have, but it's a it's a OTP code generator for two-factor authentication um, that requires an app or an interface to be able to pull those codes out. So the app passes in the current time uh, to the applet on the chip. The chip generates the codes based on that time and then mm -hmm. kicks out the, the numbers, and then you enter that, and that's your two-factor. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Andre, I'm going to show up. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. You're good. Um, so, so one of the main things that I had a question with is that um, you have Vivo Key and you have Dangerous Things. Is there a um, different um, different reason why you should buy Dangerous Things or why you should go for Vivo Key? I know you sell Vivo Key on Dangerous Things, but is there a difference between the companies in terms of uh, products well, offered? Yes. So the Vivo Key stuff is very well. Again, it's only the Spark Two that's available right now, uh, but Spark Two is all about the VivoKey application platform and ecosystem of services, which at this point in time, that ecosystem is uh, non-existent. <laughs> so the plan was to develop all these things with these various co-founders who we've kind of been churning through because again, the demands of that position and doing all the development are quite high. And it is you know, bootstrapped through uh, Dangerous Things revenue mostly at this point. So um, buying a VivoKey Spark 2 at this point We'll get you kind of a plug and play device. Um, it, you can have third parties, you know, scan it with their phone. It's going to take them to the VivoKey server. Then, depending on what you've configured that device to do, forward them onto a URL, show them your VivoKey profile data. Um, it'll do that. But <clears throat> that's pretty much where the utility of the Spark 2 ends at this point, unless you want to leverage some of the other features. So, the features of the platform, like OpenID Connect, for example. Uh, it's an OAuth 2 um, identity uh, provider application. So we wrote a plugin for WordPress. We wrote a plugin for Discourse forum software where you can authenticate with your VivoKey on either of those two platforms. Uh, but but it is OpenID Connect. So meaning any service that opens that integrates third-party OpenID Connect prov identity providers could then use your VivoKey service. And I've seen customers do that. Um, but right now it's very geared. The point is it's very geared toward developers. Uh, APIs are available and all that, but in terms of just a general user who doesn't want to program something or or put a plugin in for their WordPress or whatever, it's a basic basic uh, transponder at this point. Um, but you know, buying it is kind of like investing in that future potential. <laughs> you know, the dangerous things products will never have that potential because they are not designed to be all, really all that secure. They're just, you know, NFC in, in general is designed to share information and be open. 
it was never really designed as a, uh, a methodology for security. Um, that said, the, um, the types of chips that are NFC compliant that work with things like smartphones do have additional features. And that's how we leverage them through NFC to be able to, um, you know, validate cryptographically the, the authenticity of the chip that, that we're talking to. Okay. Now, 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 when you talk about the um, the APIs and everything, um, you you allow like different developers, um, third parties, to go and write applications for the Spark, or is that something that only you guys would do? And then, kind of no, it's that? it's it's wide open. So, um, if you go to developer.vivokey.com, you'll see the APIs described there. But we also have drop in um, development kits for Android and iOS that just you drop that in. And then it's very simple. You you instruct the user to scan a chip. You get back a user ID uh, based on. Essentially, we do a salt. So, um, the ID that's generated is a combination. It's a hash combination of the developer ID of the developer, uh, which you, they don't see. It's just a backend database uh, device, um, identifier. Then a VivoKey member ID, which again you don't see, um, and then a, a salt that we uh, add to every hash. And then that produces a unique calculated ID that that developer gets for that particular profile. And it's important to know that it's, a, uh, it's about the profile. So for example, if the user has a Spark and a Apex, or they have two Sparks, or you know whatever combination of, uh, that all of, if all of those are associated with the same user profile on, uh, on VivoKey, on the VivoKey platform, we call it a member profile. Um, if it's associated with the same member, then scanning any of them will produce the same member ID for that developer. But it's important to understand how the hash is put together because that means if you have, let's say as a developer, you have three different APIs because you have three different applications, all of those applications will receive the same member ID for that member, regardless of what chip they scan. However, another developer is gonna get a totally different ID for that member because it's a different developer account. So within your developer account, you can share and pass the ID and understand and recognize that person between your applications. So we encourage the use of a many API keys for each application. We don't want a single API key that then you end up using in 10 different applications, give each one its own API key and you can manage them appropriately. Um, and we also have a key value pair storage API for this uh, to, to be able to enable what we call light application experience. Um, so my ultimate goal really is to see something like this phone which currently, if you think about the phone, it right now the phone represents you as a as a digital identity, and the phone has more authority than you in that in that uh, in that <laughs> endeavor. So, uh, people that develop applications put a ton of uh, uh, trust in the phone. They put uh, they understand that it, well. If you unlocked your phone, then it must be you. Right, so we're just going to let you go right into your Coinbase account and transfer a million dollars of Bitcoin to someone else without any other challenge. Right, um, this, this this is the most glaring example because I use it. Uh, <laughs> I use it because it's the most glaring example. But basically, if you try to log into Coinbase, I don't know if you're familiar with Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. yep. but if you try to log into Coinbase on the web, you get a two-factor challenge. You get an email sent to you. We don't recognize your computer. You need to check on your email and confirm that you've. This is you, and it's, and it doesn't last very long. Like it, you can't say yes, remember me forever. It's 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 going to keep challenging you, right? Even on your own computer and everything. But on the phone, you go through authentication once with the username and password, and then it's it's always openable. It's, if your phone is unlocked, you tap Coinbase, you're in. You can make your transactions. Maybe it'll ask for a password, maybe, but not not in every case. And so, the and this is perpetuated over and over and over. If you gain access to someone's phone, which a phone is a general computing platform, you can hack it. It is very hackable. There are so many scary ways to be able to get into a person's phone. Um, not not even physically. Like I can get into your phone just by knowing your phone number. Um, it's very scary. So the general computing platform that is a telephone is the is the vault for currently in today's society. It is the vault for your identity. If I can get access to your phone, I have access to your email. If I have access to your email, I can reset every password you ever owned, right? I I, I can reroute your SMS messages. I can read your SMS. I mean, do anything. So um, it is a very scary concept or idea that that your phone is now more of an authority about your identity than you are. So 
in my perfect world, right, we move these things away from the phone. We move them into ourselves, right? So for example, the OTP code generator for two-factor was on my prototype implant. But between the time I got my implant and today, I've gone through four different phones. And I don't know if you've ever used an OTP code generator on your phone. You can't export those keys to another phone. You, you, you set it all up, which is a real pain, and now it's in the phone forever. If you lose the phone, you are SOL, right? You're, you're dead. You're gone. So uh, you need to go through all this other stuff. Or the worst part is if the service itself has a backup or a fallback, then the whole idea of an OTP code generator is uh, pointless because you just fall back to whatever the less secure option is if you're a hacker. If I want to get into your account, I go, oh, I don't have the OTP code, but I'll fall back to SMS because I know I can reroute that or spoof it or do whatever, or I'll fall back to something else. So I know I'm covering a lot of stuff here, but the point is I want the device to be able to say, okay, and in particular, it's just the use of the VP key app itself. If I tap my implant on my phone and I open up the VP key app, all the stuff in there is going to be basically moving to that phone and accessible only because I tapped my implant. The second I turn the phone off or turn go to a different app or whatever, that all closes down. And I ha like if I have to borrow a phone, right? For example, I do that, bam, I'm in, I make my thing or I get my code or whatever, and I hand the phone back and I'm done because they don't have the, the implant. The phone is an interface. It is a pipe between the internet and the cloud and, and my eyeballs and the chip. And that's that's it. There's no security risk in being able to, uh, you know, like I say, borrow a phone or anything like that. The phone becomes a dumb pipe, and that's the way I believe it should be. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when it comes to any of these applications, you know, the key value pair store, the idea is that you can essentially, if let's say you have an app, you know, and you you want to develop this thing around the Vivo key to be able to authenticate uh, for like let's say telemedicine, right? A telemedicine app. Uh, for your doctor. So you, you don't, you deploy into these usernames, passwords for the 80 year old grandma who doesn't get it anymore. <laughs> like she just is going <laughs> to tap her hand on a, pe on a reader on the computer or tap the phone or whatever. And you're in and all that information that tells them who and what all the connections are could be stored in the key value pair API so that when the tap of the chip happens, it unlocks that vault, that data vault and the app can pull that data out and use it and whatever. And then when it's closed, it's all, it's gone. And then the phone is just a dumb interface is the idea. I think, I think, I think that's a very good idea to be honest. Cause I, cause I've previously encountered uh, problems with uh, facial recognition, surprisingly um, uh, when it was first, well, when it was first rolling out, I remember I did an experiment with it and I thought, well, how good is this? And I went to my friend who looked similar to me, did it, unlocked mm. it instantly, was able to get into everything. And, and at that time I thought to myself, well, if he can do this, who's to say, you know, with like, let's say with fingerprints or even, you know, stuff like that, it, it becomes a huge problem. And I think definitely having a chip or an implant like that definitely helps with that because it's only you. There's no way unless someone, you know, rips it out, which I mean, I would hope that would never happen, but it's a yeah. very... And then here, I have a, I have a few stories there. So the first thing uh, I'll address is the physical attack, right? The idea of cutting a hand off or something, which always morbidly comes up. But we know through data that this doesn't happen. And how do we know that? Well, a billion plus people's bank accounts are secured with their uh, fingerprint on their phone, and nobody's cutting off thumbs, right? We know this is not an issue. Um, the thing about fingerprints in general, which I find kind of uh, humorous, is you know, we, we're at a point now in technology development where literally people are, you know, the typical Japanese like peace sign, they put up the two fingers kind of thing. They're being told not to do that anymore because the high resolution photography is taking fingerprints and you can actually duplicate the fingerprints and open up phones and things. Um, this happened in uh, Germany. The security chancellor uh, had her finger a uh, photograph taken of her finger when she was talking. She held her finger up and somebody took a photo of it. And then the Chaos Computer Club took that fingerprint photo, generated fake fingerprints, and then got into the um, security building of the government with it, with just her fake fingerprint. Um, the idea that you have control over this is also part of the issue of biometrics. Um, for example, I, uh, you know, I encountered this personally I, I went to Disney World with the family probably, 
oh, how long ago was it? It's been a while, but um, but I went there. I spent the money to get the tickets and the travel and the hotel and everything. And you get there to the front gate. And if you have a multi-day ticket, they want to make sure you're not scalping it after the first day. So they want to take your fingerprint. Nowhere in the part of process of purchasing the ticket anywhere was it declared I needed to forfeit my biometric signatures, my fingerprints, to the Disney Corporation of all people. So uh, I was furious. Um, you know, I'd already I, my choices were throw away, you know, five ten grand uh, and and not do it, or you know, submit and and give my fingerprints. So I said to the front gate people, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to know what the policy is. How long do you keep my fingerprints? Where, who do you sell them to? Do you, do you keep it forever? Do you offer it to the government or to third parties who want to purchase it? Is it used in marketing? Like, I want, I want to know all these things. What is the policy around my private personal data that you're collecting here that I can't change, by the way? I can't change my fingerprints. So I have to trust forever, the rest of my life, that Disney Corporation isn't giving away my fingerprints or whatever. And I have to trust the security of their systems that protect that data. I mean, it's just asinine right so at the end of the day uh i didn't get the answers i wanted so i said well i will submit my fingerprints but i'm not giving you my kids fingerprints they're minors you can't take them and uh they seem to agree with that so as long as myself and my wife gave our fingerprints to our, and associated those with our tickets they would let the kids in uh a compromise but holy shit yeah, like that that kind of wow. that kind of stuff I mean, we were talking about making laws about RFID and stuff. That's ridiculous. But, you know, people don't think that somehow they don't think that a biometric, which is an identifier calculated about you, that is there forever, <laughs> is not anywhere in the same realm. And it, it's, it's so much worse, right? Um, so anyway, that's, that's my spiel about I, I just really don't like biometrics. As I say, it seems to me that uh, that has tech, like you know rapid growth. I mean, I remember what before the 2010s. Um, you know, like this stuff, like it's like now, even with your product or you know the fingerprint, that's all futuristic. But as like I think like maybe like 20, 2012, 2013, I noticed that it's going very rapidly. But laws regarding at least from from what I've seen don't really seem to catch up, and it seems to be no. kind of plagued by being killed in Congress, essentially. You introduce mm -hmm. it, everyone throws a big hoopla, you know, companies say, yeah, that'll be great. Doesn't go anywhere. But companies then yeah. say, you know, oh, well, we support that, but that's it. Yeah, it's exactly. Very... I'm in the back end, they're spending a million bucks to lobby against it. Ex exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, not, it's not a good situation. And I don't ever expect it to improve, at least not here in the US. Um, there are some body autonomy laws that are in the EU that, that are promising and the GDRP, uh, the data protection um, you know, laws and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's, it's just not a good situation. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it, it does seem to me that the EU is uh, more concerned with uh, personal privacy and things like that than, than the United States. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, would it be it's very strange? I mean, the thing I've noticed in law, and in particular, this is a little uh, aside, aside, but um, I, I've noticed particularly around lidocaine, the use of lidocaine, for example. So in the U.S., lidocaine, everybody says that you have to have a prescription. Um, even the my lawyer said that, and I'm like, prove it, like show me where, right? And the 1970s era uh, FDA Act, like basically. In, in, made the whole idea of scheduled drugs, right? So you have different schedules of drugs. Cocaine, totally on the no touchy list, right? It's schedule one, I think. Um, but there's different cane family drugs and lidocaine is not on any schedule. And so um, if you look at the way the law is written, it says essentially that you, if it's a scheduled drug, you need a prescription. And then there's certain schedules you can't prescribe, it's just illegal. But <clears throat> nowhere is it saying like, well, you could just say that it needs one and that's enough, right? It's like there's no law precedent. So so really, you know, we sell lidocaine and uh, and it's essentially like a self-governing thing. Like if I tried to just buy it from a pharmacy, they'd say, no, you need a prescription with no ba legal backing, but it's their right to not sell it to me. So I can't really, I don't have a leg to stand on there. But in terms of like being able to sell it, I do. Right. So my lawyer was like, oh, you can't do that. It's illegal. They have to prove it to me. So right. the, the, but what I've noticed through this whole thing is that the U.S. 
um, you know, with, with lidocaine, for example, I can buy it. I can inject it in myself. That's all legal. But if I buy it and or somebody else buys it and then I inject it in another person or another person injects into a different person, that is the act of practicing medicine. That is illegal, right? Mm -hmm. So the lidocaine itself is not. So uh, what I noticed is that in the U.S., laws tend to uh, make behaviors, acts illegal. In the EU, they tend to make things illegal. So in the EU, a gun is illegal. In the U.S., it's totally legal. You just can't shoot anybody, right? So this is, and well, in some cases you can, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but the whole point is that the act of doing something, typically speaking, in the U.S. is what's focused on, not the thing itself. And so in the EU, the thing itself is, is very much illegal. But when it, you're right, when it comes to, per, you know, personal data, privacy, that kind of stuff, um, it's, <clears throat> it is very uh, much more advanced in the U.S. And I think really that's because of, Nazi Germany in World War II and and their rise to power in the EU in the later half of the century uh, really informed a lot of that kind of thing because you know in general they're very as a as a people they're very cognizant about personal privacy in the government for good reason yeah. <laughs> you know yeah they learned they saw that movie yeah, um, yeah. Would, would you say so in our in our talk um, would it be fair to say uh, like the the biggest strength of um, Spark Two and um, and maybe Apex is is the security. I mean, it seems to me like you. The if I were to say, hey, the, the greatest thing about this is is the security, and I can do I, it conveniently. Yeah, I would say it is the because the, when security is a funny thing, people don't care about security. The only people that care about security are people that have been um, proven insecure, right? The hacked, the bank account's been emptied, that kind of stuff. Then all of a sudden we care about security. So um, I would just say this, the greatest strength is that, um, that it unequivocally proves who you are. Like you are you, right? The idea is that once it's in your body, Yes, it could be removed. Yes, it could be replaced. Yes, it could be removed forcefully without consent. But those things generally don't happen. So it is a digital cryptographic proof of your authenticity, right? When you're trying to present yourself to a digital system, and if you think about this, it is a token. And and if you think about every key on your keychain, every card in your wallet, those are tokens. They represent you in some way to a system. And that system might be a mechanical lock. It might be a payment card that you present to the bank so you can pay for things. But in, in essence, it boils down to being an identity token. If you have this key, you are authorized to access this door, that kind of thing. Um, or if you have this driver's license, you are, you know, your identity is, it's a token of your identity. And so um, Vivo Key is secure enough to be, uh, act as a digital identity token to the systems that that uh, that integrate it, and and so much so more than I mean, you look at again. This is on the side, but if you look at um, this, the way payment works, like payment cards, it's a ludicrous, right? So we we have the credit card number, uh, then we had the credit card number and the expiration date, and then we have the credit card number and the expiration date and the security code on the back. But this touches on the fundamental problem of these types of systems is that they rely on static data. It is not a cryptographic challenge response. It is a is a secure well, it's a security system based on shared information, right? So this is a in the terms of cryptography, it's a shared key. So your your credit card number was that shared key. You know the credit card number. The bank knows the credit card number. You give that credit card number to the merchant. That means the bank can trust that you, the credit card provider or holder, presented that information to the merchant. Obviously, we know that doesn't work because you could steal that static data and then pretend to be the person, right? Same with secure, you know, social security numbers, any static data. It's ridiculous that we use these types of identifiers for highly secure transactions. On top of that, the way payments work in general is also ludicrous in that it is a digitized version of walking into a merchant, buying a thing, opening your wallet with a bunch of cash, then turning your back on the merchant and saying, only take what you need, 
Because <laughs> when you provide this information to a merchant, they are the ones that are setting the amount, right? They're the ones saying, I'm going to pull 200 bucks, but not a penny more. And I promise I'm going to protect your credit card information, which of course, not a lot of them do. And so there's all these, the way it works is ridiculous. So when it comes to like applications like blockchain, cryptocurrency and, and the like, what's not possible with static data identifiers, like a credit card number or a driver's license or whatever, is that you can prove attestations. You can prove uh, that you are over 21, for example, without actually giving them your birthday. Uh, that's an attestation challenge. You can say, yep, uh, this person is over 21, but they don't need to know your birthday. You can cryptographically prove through zero, zero knowledge proof that this is true without having the basis for that truth. Um, and so uh, when it comes to cryptographic payments, cryptocurrency payments, you can, uh, which is all a push system. So the credit cards are a pull. The merchant will pull and you trust that they're going to do that once and for the correct amount. Crypto is all push. Nobody can pull money from your wallet. You have to say, I want to push this amount to this merchant, right? That means that the simple idea of tapping a card and getting the hell out of there is not how it works, right? Because you have to, you, you don't want to trust the terminal at the merchant. You need to have trusted equipment that you work with that you can designate the amount and who it goes to and push that. But, um, but the whole point that is that through, through this digital proof of authenticity that is essentially you as a human being, you now have um, agency on blockchains. You now have agency in um, you know, working with these digital services, telemedicine, things like that, where the, the trust factor, right? Uh, you, you, you know you're working with the right person is so much higher than any other thing. Even if you integrated the security features into something like a card or a wearable or wristband or whatever, there's no way to know that somebody didn't just pick it up because you took it off and forgot it. And now somebody else is going to get into your you know, medical data or your Bitcoin wallet. So again, this whole idea of trust and security and convenience an implant is the apex, which is why we chose the name, is the apex of all those things. It is very trustable that you're dealing with the right person. It's highly unlikely that, that somebody has removed the, the device from under your skin. That's ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. um, I always say, you know, if you have enough value in terms of assets or whatever, for somebody to want to take a chip out of you, you probably also can afford bodyguards. So, you know... <laughs> You're probably going to be okay, but uh, but the point is that that the implant belies a level of trust that uh, that you just can't get with any other kind of medium, wearable device, phone technology, biometric. It just it just doesn't exist. I think man, that that answers all, almost all of my questions right there. To be honest, I mean that's um that's very good. I I will I will say one thing. Um, um in the same way. That well before oh, take, taking a sign up electric cars they've been around even since like the um, gasoline powered ones I know that in 20, 2013 give or take uh, Elon Musk came out you know Model S and blew everyone away it was this huge new new thing and now they're doing still really well with multiple different other cars you know Cybertruck ATV you know solar panels what you have it um, do you see something like that kind of a level, I guess, either through you or through other co-founders or whatever, do you see something like that happening in the near future? Or is there going to be a different kind of way that that's going to be come about into a mainstream topic? You mean implants in general? Yes. Mm. So that's an interesting, broad, very broad question. Um, you know, I would probably, rather than Tesla, I would reference Neuralink, right? Um, another Musk backed company working on brain implants. And, um, you know, typically speaking, the, the, let me, re let me go back even further. So <laughs> when we talk about these technologies, oftentimes we talk about them in terms of restorative technologies for healthcare reasons or purposes, medical devices, pacemakers, things like that. Um, and those clearly, those technologies for the, for the most part of their history have been less than. They've been less capable, right? So we don't concern ourselves with the augmentative aspects of those technologies. You need a pacemaker. Well, that sucks worse than having a working heart, but 
uh, it's better than having a not working heart, right? So we don't care about those kind of things. However, that is changing. Technology is producing solutions that in certain contexts or whatever are better than um, human performance. For example, Oscar Pistorius running the Paralympics. Uh, he also ran in the regular Olympics. People don't realize that he ran in both the Paralympics and regular Olympics. And in the regular Olympics, he was getting complaints from others that said his running blades offered him an unfair advantage. Can you imagine, right? Like in that context, yes, it's just, it's a narrow context, but this is going to happen more and more and more frequently. And so Neuralink, I think, is going to push that envelope quite a lot, right? So we're talking, you know, when you, when you look at Elon Musk's discussion points uh, about Neuralink early on, it was very much about, um, you know, we're going to take this and we're going to connect brains to computers and we're going to compete with AI and that's how humanity has to move forward. Otherwise, we're going to be relics, right? And it's not going to work. Well, you know, <laughs> over time, that's been toned down. And now we're talking about where we're going to make paraplegics walk again. We're going to, you know, heal the sick. We're going to, you know, be restorative in our technology release. But Neuralink is exactly that technology that has such a huge augmentative potential uh, above and beyond just healing or restoring function, it is capable of bringing it well beyond. And I'm not talking about like streaming music, you know, directly into your brain or whatever. I'm talking about like linking neural networks with digital neural networks with expanding cognition in general. Like these are these are things that are now visible in terms of human timeline. Like I'm I'm middle aged, but I think I'm still going to be alive when we see a neural link. Uh, actually improving brain function to the point where it's an augment, right? We're considering it to be augmented. Um, these are the things to watch out for in terms of where things are going uh, and how we're going to get to mass adoption because improvements in human uh, capabilities has been the driver of technological um, adoption and innovations and then things built on other things. And I think when it comes to the last 15, 16 years of what I've done since 2005, probably the most important thing I've done is change society slowly. And that's proved to me by people's reaction. In 2005, when I would say, oh, I got a chip implant in my left hand, and I can open my doors and stuff. The reaction was most often very typically visceral and negative and violent. Not, I mean, sometimes you would run into people, particularly very young people, that were like, oh, that's cool. But most, for the most part, it was very negative. Over the years, now, if I were to walk outside, right, and I would say, hey, I got a chip implant and I can open my door. My neighbor, I showed him the garage door, bing bong, like, you know, opens, the door, he goes, oh, hmm. oh, good for you. Not for me, <laughs> but, you know, whatever. A much more benign reaction. And that is because, I don't know if you are familiar with the, uh, marketing psychology term, the mere effect exposure, or mere, mere exposure effect, sorry. Mere exposure effect says that the more often you are exposed to something, if you are not conscious of it, you will have a more positive outlook of that thing when consciously engaging with it. Meaning you can hear the same advertisement a hundred times and not pay it any attention. But then when you finally do pay attention, you have a much more positive reaction to it than uh, if you had not had those exposures, and that's because you have a general sense of familiarity with it. The same thing happens whenever you say, oh, I just heard of this new word, uh, and now suddenly I'm hearing it everywhere, right? Or whatever, right? And that, that experience is the exposure effect taking hold because you have heard that thing before, you just didn't pay any attention. And it is commonly used, you just didn't hear it because you didn't care about it or whatever. And now, because you have a, you have reason to, to pick that word out, now suddenly it's everywhere. Everybody's talking uh, and using this word or whatever it is, right? And so over the 15, 16 years, I have been in nearly countless number of media interviews and things where radio interviews, TV media, all this stuff. So to find a person that is older than 16 years old uh, and who has, quote, never heard of uh, a chip implant, right? That's just not possible. They have heard of it. They've been exposed to this idea. Um, it's just now that they're engaging with it, 
has become a cognitive thing and they're like, oh, okay. And, and, and there's a gen in general, a more, more positive outlook. Now there's a negative t uh, side to this as well. Whereas if your exposure has all been negative, you have a negative reaction to it, or you, at least your, um, your skepticism is high. And this is, this has occurred generally speaking with Hollywood movies. So if you have any example of a TV show or a Hollywood movie, I guarantee that that reference to a chip implant is going to be extremely negative for the person with the chip implant. It's going to be, uh, I can track you around. It's going to be, I can kill you remotely with a cyanide explosion or I can whatever, right? Whatever it is, that chip implant is a massive liability for the person with the chip implant. It's always a negative. And so this is a disinformation campaign put on by Hollywood and, and you know, anything like that is ridiculous. And I, that, that is the tide against which we fight every day. Um, you know, we'll have people, oh, what about, you know, you've seen it happen in the COVID-19 and vaccine bullshit where people were like, oh, you get a vaccine, there's going to be a chip in there. Like, dude, trust me. Have you seen the size of a vaccine needle? Have you seen the size of our product? <laughs> it just physically doesn't work. It's dumb. So anyway, I mean, even the idea, and this, this extends into uh, marketing tactics, for example. So uh, for example, like if you talk to any maker of a, a chip implant for pets, dogs and cats, they often refer to it as a tracking chip, but it doesn't do that at all. You cannot find a lost pet. There's no tracking of it. You, It's an identification technology. So I have talked to people who I've said, well, no, it's very much like the pet chip where you just identify the thing, but you have to do that at a vet office very close. And they themselves were like, what do you mean? It's a tracking chip. I got one for my cat. I'm like, yeah, but if your cat gets lost, you can't find your cat. Like, yeah, that's what it, that's what they said it does. I'm like, no, talk to them, right, call them right now. They will say, no, the cat has to be found and then we scan it and then we can tell you who the owner is. So, I mean, this disinformation campaign is partly on purpose, um, you know, from marketers who are just trying to spice up their products to um, to just the general trope of the microchip being a tracking device or something. I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, we've been in this uh, game for a long time and we've never been called by anybody uh, to to validate any of this technology. It's just been, that's just what it is. A chip implant is a tracking device um, and it's always going to be a bad thing. It's just like generally accepted, like the, your example with the lidocaine. I mean, everyone would say, oh yeah, you can't, it's a, you, you have to have a prescription, but you don't. And, you know, everyone said, yeah, it's a tracking thing, but it's not. It's, yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I hope I don't, uh, I probably, this wouldn't offend you, but uh, I had a negative uh, thought about this and, until talking to you. I would say not only do I have you changed my mind, but I, I'm actually enthusiastic about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and this is, again, I don't blame people who literally their only education about the technology has been through exposure of movies and television who, you know, they present it as this kind of crazy tracking thing. And that, if that's the only way you've ever encountered this kind of technology is through these uh, fantastical stories, then yeah, I don't blame you at all. But the difference is that you still got on the call, right? Yeah. We, we do deal with people that uh, yeah. will hurl death threats and insults yeah. and then just go away and never want to actually learn anything about it. Yeah. I, I think I was more of, uh, yeah, that's, that's a nice, you know, gadget gimmick thing, but what can it really do? And, and talking with you, I really see the, uh, the security and the convenience and, and the, you know, the practical applications. Yeah. I knew my dog's track, you know, implant is not a tracker, uh, sure. but I didn't know, you know, all the things that, uh, that the implant can do and, and will do, you know, in the future, this is like in your description of, you know, wide open, how many things can happen. It's, it's, it's remarkable. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny. Like, um, you know, we're still trying to get this idea around, um, what is going to be the mass market adoption thing. And to be honest, I think the, the answer there is uh, quite honestly payment. Uh, particular contactless payment outside of the U.S. In the U.S., contactless payment is kind of like meh, but in the EU, Canada, Australia, basically everywhere else, contactless payment is like it's the thing that everyone asks for. And at the moment, all the technology is there. We just don't have approvals from Mastercard or Visa because of the attitudes about chip implants in the U.S. And so they said we don't want to affect our market. Um, you know, our stock price or anything by having a controversy. So we're not going to allow it. Um, and it's been that way for five years now. So we've been 
constantly knocking on the door trying to get it, but we'll we'll keep knocking. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Andre, uh, well, I mean, we've taken almost two hours of your time. Uh, Amal, thank you so much. Andre, I, I, I filled out my three or four pieces of, you know, taking notes furiously. I don't know if you had anything else, but but uh, you, you hit all my questions. Um, cool. Let me see. I think um, the really, I mean, the last question that I have really is, what, uh, in your opinion, what what do you think is the next step from this? I mean, it was first with the implants, and now what else? What what what, what can you see that these can potentially introduce, like new products or yeah, you know, new innovations? I know, I know that's been a common question about where, what's the next thing? What are we going to go? What what kind of technology is going to be developed next? And there are thing, there are places to go. Um, active de- active devices. So you'll notice that these are all passive transponders. They don't have batteries or power sources of their own. Uh, making a consumer grade device with a battery is a recipe for death and disaster. Um, you know, a pacemaker has quality assurance processes from every you know ore mined out of the ground to every component and everything like that. So you know, these highly explosive batteries, you know, lithium ion technologies are checked and double checked and x-ray inspected and all that that's why they're thirty thousand dollars for you know a, a pacemaker or whatever you know whatever it is so it it's really um you know once we have a battery chemistry um that is going to be safe uh, and be able to handle you know a well-designed circuit but that resistor went out of spec because it was a cheap part you know a consumer grade part or whatever it's going to be able to handle that without off gassing exploding thermal runaway chemical degradation right all these things that can happen in a battery uh once we have that then we're going to have some pretty innovative interesting device implant devices that are consumer grade devices these are cheap accessible implants you can do cool things with but um even if we did get that technology tomorrow Uh, and we could develop these things, it would be a disservice to all the things that are possible with the existing technology, right? Um, There's a few things that I would want to develop with an active device that I think would be interesting and useful, but uh, all the things we could still develop with, with just the chip implants we have, those those applications need attention. And so, for example, um, just a patient identity application, within that, you have telemedicine, app, you have lobby login, you have uh, consolidation of duplicate record, dupl- record duplication through mismatched patient identity is a killer. Like people die from like having half the records on one MR, you know, uh, medical record and half on the other. Um, so even in that realm, there's a ton of little micro verticals that need to be explored, including the idea of like <clears throat> being able to identify someone with dementia um, <clears throat> or being able to do what an ER, like come, somebody comes in the ER, you pop it open. All those things uh, have so much more to do than with, with all the systems around the chip implant, right? Policies, procedures. Mm-hmm. How do we know who's got a chip? How do we, what's the policy for scanning it? What's the technology to integrate all this stuff? There's so much to do in each one of these verticals that um, being distracted by the next shiny thing is probably <laughs> going to be a disservice to to what is possible now with all these things. And, um, you know, as I said, I think I think probably companies like Neuralink, um, they're they're developing these these technologies. Very interesting. You know, we might come up with some consumer grade stuff once a, a you know safe battery chemistry comes out. Um, that enables a cheap consumer grade device to be become an implant. Um, but I, I don't know that the impact to human society will be the, all that great unless we really do a great job of making these vertical markets uh, a reality and so that we can do something like leave the house without our keys or wallet, get on a plane by scanning our chip without having to pull our passport out, like be able to buy a coffee, be able to get in our car. Like, um, you know, the Vivo Key Apex has a Tesla uh, key card applet, which just happened to be compatible. We reverse engineered their key card applet uh, and made a compatible applet so that you can register your Apex. Uh, you can tap the car and get in without any modification to the car. That works on the Model 3 and the Model Y, maybe the new Model S, I'm not sure. But anyway, the point is that like without really exploring all those verticals properly, um, it just, you know, the, the dream of being able to kind of be f- a free human that can move 
through the digital space and the and the real world space with the same ease and freedom that you did as a kid. You know, when you when you were a kid, you ran out the door without a care in the world. You didn't have to carry your keys or anything. And okay. you know, now you try that and as an adult and you're like crippled. You're like get around the corner, you're like, where's my wallet? Oh my God, what if I'm locked out? You know, I think there's been a couple comedians that have talked about this, but uh, the most recent one I think was Adam Sandler. He did a like a stand up special or like a it was like a it was singing uh, like a rap song and he did a song called Phone Wallet Keys. Uh, and it's about all the crap you have to carry around with you all the time. And it's true, those three things I kind of call our modern day Tomagachi. Um, we have to feed and care for them, you know, constantly. And it's it's not the days you forget your keys or you lose your keys. It's every day that you're managing these things constantly with your uh, with your attention, with your energy. I haven't used my keys in 15 years, 16 years, and it's been great. Like it's one third of my daily management burden is gone. Um, and I want to get rid of the wallet next, right? I don't think we'll ever get rid of the phone <clears throat> because of the way that <clears throat> the phone works and the technology ra- changes so rapidly. But the phone can become a brick that just sits in my pocket. Um, and the rest of my interactions can be done through a chip implant. That's that's great. Like I want to be able to do that. So that's my goal. I mean, I mean that that just trying to just trying to think about all that all like 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 you said, just getting rid of all like the, you know the keys and everything, having it on a chip. It's it it's it's some it's futuristic, but I mean it it seems it, it's something that is very very close to being actually achieved. I mean, wow. I mean, I don't um, I don't know uh, if you have any other more questions. I mean, do you have any questions for us or anything like that or? Um, probably, but. At the same time, I think it's probably more uh, important that you get all your questions answered. See, I mean, I don't, I don't think I have any more questions. Uh, Bob, do you have any more? Or? Nope. I'm, no, I'm good. I'm, I've got, I've, I got more than my questions, and you sparked some other questions. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, we we had questions coming into this that we thought, but then as uh, as we were as the discussion went on, I realized that some of these questions you had answered some didn't make any sense anymore now that I understood it better. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I feel like I have a pretty good understanding. Uh, not, not, not great, you know, but, uh, pretty <laughs> sure, good sure. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they, you know, go through your notes and, and watch the recording or whatever. And then uh, if you have any clarifying questions, or whatever, we can schedule another chat. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. All right. Let me go ahead and stop the recording.